Welcome in to the early line. We are live right here on Sports Grid. I'm Kevin Walsh coming to you live from Parts Unknown, joined as always by Donnie Wrightside. DRS, how you feeling? Goof. I uh, mean, you kidding me? I'm feeling good here. Second half of the Major League Baseball season gets underway today. We have live games, Kevin, and we're not even going to wait on these games. We get them going in the afternoon today. So mm-hmm. back in business, as we like to say, right here on the early line. Good setup for baseball preview. Couple more of these season long numbers oh, yeah. around Major League Baseball that we need to get into. But we begin with a headline that it took me a while to believe was real. You have to be kidding me. The San Francisco 49ers have given Jimmy Garoppolo and his team the okay to start seeking a trade. What? I love this. Uh, This is one of my favorite reports yesterday because we've got more content out of Jimmy Garoppolo, Trey Lance, and the 49ers than anything we've done in this offseason. So now we're led to believe that said, you know what, March, April, May, I mean, we've been fighting teams off with a stick so they can't get the Jimmy Garoppolo. Heck, I've even turned down two first-round draft picks. You're probably getting John Lynch to say at this point. But now, finally, we're ready to move on from Jimmy Garoppolo. I told his agent, go out and seek a deal. (laughs) What deal are we making here, Kevin, at this point? What deal? Forget that. What have they been doing the whole time? Are you kidding me? I like, as it what? Oh, they, they, from, from when the season ended till now, they actually didn't want Jimmy G to leave. No. But yesterday, something, they went, you know what, man? We got to let Jimmy G go find a trade on us. Uh, we, again, we will break this down. We'll also talk a little bit about some tight end news. Kyle Rudolph signs with the Bucks late night there. Looks like they really need to solidify a Gronk replacement. But the big one to me, Donnie, is Darren Waller seeking that extension from the Vegas Raiders. And it's only right for him because you show up to camp. You're one of the best tight ends in the NFL. You're not paid like one. And also you sit down and say, hey, Hunter Renfro, how did your offseason go? Great, man, got paid. Oh, good Mm -hmm. to see you over here. Coming over from the Green Bay Packers, Devontae Adams. How you doing this year? Boy, I got paid too. How about you? Yeah, I didn't get paid. Now I want to get paid. It makes some sense when you have the leverage like Waller does now. You got to swing that hammer and go get paid. And not only when you have the leverage, but when you consider who is in that room this year, you know, we talked about oh, the price of the brick went up. Not if he yep. plays a full season, most likely with Devontae Adams inserted into the equation. We'll give you an idea of where the season long projections lie for that big three, if you will Devontae, Renfro, and of course, Darren Waller. In the NBA, it is official. James Harden has signed his deal with the Philadelphia 76ers. Two years, $68.6 million for James Harden. I know it's a big number, but Donnie, that really is quite the pay cut that Harden took to stay in Philly. It's good to see, too, because I think James Harden knew, like, I made a lot of money in the NBA. I'm going to continue to make a lot of money. But the goal here is in Philadelphia is to finally put a championship, you know, on my name, as we like to say. So he says to Daryl Morey, hey, look, I'll take less here. What are you going to do with it? Allowed them to get Mm -hmm. P.J. Tucker. Allowed them to get House here. And then he still signs for a really nice extension where if he plays well, Kevin, he can renegotiate that at the end of the year with a player opt-out clause. I think it worked out perfectly. And it's one of those where we look at Westbrook out in L.A. going, you could do something like this. You really couldn't. Uh, yeah. So it's a good look for Harden and the Sixers, though, for sure. It's a great point by you as our radio audience enters the mix here on this Thursday morning. Kevin Walsh, Donnie, right side, Sirius XM, Channel 159. Harden going out there and making the necessary sacrifices to give this Sixers team the best chance to compete. With the comparison to Russell Westbrook, the latest around the Lakers is they are going to continue to explore deals that don't just exclusively mean Kyrie Irving. Renegotiated talks or re-engaged talks, I should say, with the Indiana Pacers centered around Buddy Heald perhaps joining the Purple and Gold. Yeah, it makes some sense. The Lakers are trying to explore all avenues here to make their team better. You don't want to waste Anthony Davis and LeBron James. Quite frankly, we don't know how many more years together they have in Los Angeles, but it seems like the whole crux of the argument, once again, is Russell Westbrook. Why did you opt into this $50 million a year number that you had? It could have made it easier on all sides if we worked or massaged that cap. But the Lakers, they're under the gun right now, Kevin. They are. They have to make some adjustments because if they come back as is, I don't think we're feeling too good about the Lakers in 2022, 2023 here. 
and we talk about the leverage game, this applies as well. Something to keep in mind when you take a look at the landscape right now in the NBA. In Major League Baseball, though, of course, as we mentioned off the top, the second half begins. And I think one of the best parts about today's slate, probably the best part about today's slate, is that it features a double header between the Yankees and the Astros. What a way to get things started. Yeah, right off the bat. We don't know official pitchers there, but we'll certainly take a look at those games a little bit later in the show. But that is a great way to get it started. Meaningful baseball right off the bat between the Yanks and the Astros, the two best teams in the AL. Now, a story that for maybe some doesn't qualify as a major story, but for this show, a sad day to see Dallas Keuchel, Donnie, DFA'd. Hopefully someone somewhere picks this guy back up. Yep, if I could quote a famous song here, I will remember you, <laughs> Dallas Keuchel. What a shame here, Kevin. I mean, absolutely a shame. We thought we'd get at least one or yeah. two starts. But hey, guys, don't feel bad for Dallas Keuchel. It's probably going to end up on the Washington Nationals for the rest of the season, too, the way they operate. Slot right in for Patrick Corbin if he is dealt. Also, the three MTs off. Tony Finau is the pre-tournament favorite. A lot of good stuff coming there. We come right back We're talking Jimmy Garoppolo on the early line. Sports today. The Baltimore Orioles take uh, Jackson Holiday, who is a shortstop. And according to Keith Law from The Athletic, he was basically one of the guys who did the, uh, you know, improved his draft stock the most over the last 12 months. He uh, essentially he got into the gym, reworked his body so that uh, he kind of went from more of a, a contact, even swing plane type pitch to, or a hitter to a, like a power hitter. The Sports Grid Network. The morning after. The starter for the AL is Shane, Man- Shane McClanahan, but maybe Shohei will pitch at a certain point, but Shohei will lead off in that spot. And it's the first pitch of the game to Shohei Otani. The betting favorite right now is a strike or a foul tip. That's even money, plus 100. But why not take a shot? Why not sprinkle that Shohei makes some contact, puts one into play? That's plus 550. Any other outcome. We're going for plus money tonight at the All-Star Game. The Sports Grid Network. Pharrell, coast to coast. What he has done, Scott, is just, it's old school, man. I mean, a guy that when he throws, if I'm a relief pitcher, I'm like, all right, I got the night off, I guess, because he's not going to let me come into the game. Uh, He's just going to basically tell Magley, like, sit your ass down in the dugout. I'm going to finish this game because I can't trust the bullpen. The guy is 8, 9 innings, 100, 105, 110, 115. The Sports Grid Network. You might be the next Daily Fantasy Millionaire. No matter what you watch or where you play, learn from the world's best DFS players. Lineup building tools, expert projections, and advanced stats change the way you play the game. Dominate the competition. DailyRoto.com, the player's choice. early line do you think a big 12 pack 12 merger would have made sense no i don't i don't because when you add more teams in kevin you're gonna divvy up more pieces of the pie it's the reason why you see these big guys leaving and we're looking right now at these pack 12 teams kevin and saying to ourselves what are you actually bringing to the table to the big 12 apparently not enough only on sports grid
back right here on the early line. Man, the Jimmy Garoppolo headlines have continued to shine favorably on this show. At this point, though, again, I think in, when he's eventually cut, we'll give you one final victory lap. I don't know. All right, let me not tell you to be a final victory lap, but that's really when we'll up the ante. But the story that we have here today is so puzzling. I have to now question a Niners organization that I do think has largely operated with success. What is going on in San Francisco? The story goes that they have now decided to give Jimmy Garoppolo and his team, his agent, the okay to now seek a trade. What in the world have they been doing for months? Operating at less than zero leverage. An overrated quarterback, an overpaid quarterback who is injured. Of course the market is not robust. And you mean to tell me, Donnie, that they have been basically limiting their opportunities to engage with football teams because they haven't been allowing the Garoppolo side to potentially find landing spots? No wonder there's been zero traction on a Garoppolo deal. What are they doing in San Francisco? Let's put this in the housing market here, Kevin. Ready for this one? I put my house up for sale in February. Nobody buys it for three months. I take it off the market. I change the doorknob and put it right back on the market and say, here we go. Everybody come look at my house. Come buy my house. Now, isn't it beautiful? And you go see the house. Now, hold on. What changed here? The doorknob. It's brand new. This, this is what you wanted. No, no, no. I already saw this house. I didn't like it three months ago. You changed the doorknob. I still don't want it today. So if we're looking at a Jimmy Garoppolo perspective, I believe this is just the organization saying, hey, look, behind the scenes, we talk to every single NFL team. Nobody wants Jimmy Garoppolo. Now I'll call the agent. Hey, do you have any buyers out there that you can bring in to take a look at this quote unquote house for us? Uh, I'll check around here for us. And also, let's get something straight here. NFL teams are businesses, Kevin. They're not stupid. They say to themselves, now, hold on. You're telling me right now you want, let's just say, a fourth-round draft pick for Jimmy Garoppolo, and then I pay him $26 million, which is what his base salary is next year? Or I can wait you out, and in two weeks when you cut him, I can set him for the sign him for the veteran minimum or something way below that, maybe one year, $5 million with incentives here. But also, Kevin, the same way we talked about Baker Mayfield. What are you waiting for here? You got to get to your next team. Do you want another contract? Do you want to be have a legitimate chance to start for another franchise? What is Jimmy Garoppolo's camp doing right now? Hey, no problem, guys. Take your time because the day before the season starts, you're going to cut me and I have zero chance to land anywhere else. Is that what Garoppolo's camp is looking for? I'm surprised it's actually come to this, but you're right. The farce of now we're going to accept trade offers here for Jimmy Garoppolo sensational stuff. You should get your own Netflix, you know, stand-up comedy out there, John Lynch. But I am curious, too, is how much is the Garoppolo side to blame here? Like, I understand the season ended. He's been propped up by everybody around yeah. him, I'm sure. Look, I just hope I go to a winning organization. Within a month, he should have known that was not in the cards, right? As the Steelers were running to the Trubisky window, as you had the Colts trade for Matt Ryan, the Commanders trade for Carson Wentz, all of these opportunities were being gobbled up here, right? Brady unretires, which all you know takes another landing spot off the board for you. Because the one thing that we know is Garoppolo is cut, and about $25 million just evaporates from kind of the Garoppolo situation, which I am sure has been a part of the reason. He's like, well, hopefully they trade me so I can then keep that money. But who is willingly trading for Garoppolo? and then paying him the seventh biggest cap hit in football at the quarterback position for this upcoming year? The answer, of course, is nobody. Because now we sit here. Donnie, this is the reality around Garoppolo. I don't know what the market looks like for Jimmy G if the cost to bring him in is $0. So, of course, this is what's going on here if it's $25 million. So, let's try and give ourselves a legitimate chance here for just a minute, Donnie. Can you name me two, three, four, heck, 
just one team that makes sense for Garoppolo? Just forget the money for a minute. Does Is there a football team where you go, okay, they really should, or a couple maybe, that they really should be bringing in Garoppolo to their quarterback room? It, it's really only one team, and I guess it's the team that everybody's looking at that says they have a fantastic quarterback room. That's Pete Carroll and the Seahawks, where he would fit in. But let's understand what Jimmy Garoppolo is at this point in his career. You had a ready-made football team with one of the best offensive minds in Kyle Shanahan, weapons all around, and it didn't work out. So what other organization is saying to themselves, you know what the missing piece is for us to get over the hump is a quarterback that not even Kyle Shanahan trusted in the biggest moments. Nobody's going to do that here. And also, if you are the Seattle Seahawks, and quite frankly, I don't know what the Seahawks are doing. Uh, their mindset to me, or their moves have shown me they're ready for a rebuild at all costs, where their GM is saying, yeah, yes, Pete, even though I think you really don't understand this and we're going to tell you, you had Drew Locke on your team and Geno Smith because we don't want to win football games. We need a quarterback. We just don't want to win football games. So the sense of bringing Jimmy Garoppolo in, what does it even do for your team? This isn't a gunslinger. It's not like Jameis Winston a couple years ago said, hey, look, I see the talent. This guy threw for 5,100 yards, over 30 touchdowns. I think we can make him into something and he can turn into our franchise guy. There's nobody around the league that goes, hey, Jimmy was in an elite system through 20 touchdown passes and 12 interceptions, and we've seen him on the biggest stage not be able to perform. That's the guy that we want. That's the guy to get a long-term deal because the same way we look at, Kevin, money that's getting spread around the NFL, the price of paying a starting quarterback, regardless of who that starting quarterback is, is expensive. So as a team out there going to go, you know what? Let's trade for him and give him, because Jimmy Garoppolo's camp is going to understand this. If he's going to be in a starting role, he's not going to take one year, Kevin, $7 million. He's not going to take one year deal at all. He's going to say, okay, average price for a quarterback, five years, $150 million, with 40 guaranteed for a lower level starting quarterback. Yeah, that's what I'm going to take. Who is going to do that? Nobody's going to do that. Of course not. Oh, And I mean, again, he's going to... Look, he might as well start calling XFL teams if that's the way he's going to approach this. I'll tell you that right now. You go through these lists here, all right? Maybe you say, whoa, 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 come on. Garoppolo's better than Mariota. Doesn't matter. Atlanta's not going to pivot to Jimmy G all of a sudden. They've brought in Mariota. Maybe you think that Garoppolo is better than Trubisky. I'd probably end up agreeing with you, but it doesn't matter. They brought in Trubisky, and they drafted yeah. Kenny Pickett in the first round. That's not a legitimate landing spot there. Then there's a bunch of teams with young quarterbacks who are trying to see what kind of sauce they have, right? And, and that's a, a New York Jets and Zach Wilson. You can believe Garoppolo will win you more football games than Zach Wilson, but there's a 0% chance the Jets pivot off of Zach Wilson for Jimmy Garoppolo. There's realistically, and I think I'm talking about realistically, maybe three situations I could have an, a, a legitimate conversation on. Seattle's the obvious one. Seattle is the obvious one because nobody's believing in Geno, and Drew Locke hasn't been in Seattle to where it's like, okay, come on, we got to give this guy one more chance. The only other two, Donnie, if you'd made me try and give you a long list, the Texans, because Davis Mills doesn't come with the level of draft capital that guarantees you a second year, and Daniel Jones, because it feels like we've been doing the Daniel Jones thing forever, and if the Giants wanted to say, okay, you know what, at the minimum, make them compete in camp, okay, fine. But still, Donnie, it's clear yeah. that the Texans and the Giants want to go with younger quarterbacks, and if they're bad, they're bad, and they'll reset. And let's also remember, the jobs were available, Kevin. It wasn't as if we came into the season like, oh, man, there's no landing spots in here. The Colts had a viable landing spot. The Commanders had a viable landing spot. You're talking about, again, the same thing with the Atlanta Falcons. Everybody knew Jimmy G was going to be moved on from, from the San Francisco yep. 49ers, and those front offices already accounted for that. If they wanted him, he would have already been on a different team that was looking for a quarterback in the offseason. Spot on. It's not news that Garoppolo can be had, and he's still in San Francisco. We transition to the NBA next. Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. 
people are going to the betting window betting and betting them the now rim. before the trade takes place. How Diamond dare bets. they do what's fiscally responsible? See how it plays out. Buffalo's going all in right Football now. Football full circle. All their chips in the middle of the table. It's do or die for And Godwin being out. They, they've had a little bit of a shakeup. In-game live all access. You could take the points. You could take the money line. And we either go to San Jose too. Maybe a small play on San Jose. I want to go both underdogs here. I don't want to hear it anymore. Wow. In game live. Prime. He plays time. like he did in game five. They are going to be all good in game six at home. Oh, boy, you want to give me eight and a half points with a desperate team facing a little Get the winning edge. Only on Sports Grid, your 24 7 sports wagering network. You might be the next Daily Fantasy Millionaire. No matter what you watch or where you play, learn from the world's best DFS players. Lineup building tools, expert projections, and advanced stats change the way you play the game. Dominate the competition. DailyRoto.com, the player's choice. The morning after. So today we hit the streets of Manhattan to test New Yorkers baseball knowledge and to see how many all stars we have. Dom Mattingly was a former player for the Yankees. Now a head coach of. I don't know, man. I know nothing about sports. Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers plays football, but relatively close. Jeter. Derek Jeter. Uh, Derek Jeter. Derek Jeter. Aaron Judge. Aaron Judge. Aaron Judge. Aaron Judge. Aaron Judge it is. We're in New York. They love the Yankees. The Sports Grid Network. Pharrell, coast to coast. He is finished. He'll come back next year. It'll happen again, and he'll never pitch again. That'll be the end of it. I, I think that Strasburg had his, he had his moment in that World Series when the Nationals won it. He gave it all out, that, and he, he had injury problems before that. And now he just hasn't been able to stay on the field since. Uh, it's unfortunate, but I think that he is finished. The Sports Grid Network. The early line. But overall, I mean, this is as good a performance as you're going to find in professional sports. When you talk about, like, the dunk competition, this is by far better than the dunk competition at this point. These guys are getting after it and enjoying themselves. They, they definitely are. I'm not sure if there really is any all-star side event that stacks up right now to the home yeah. run derby. It's, it's In a way, it's, it's simplicity is what gets the job done. Only on Sports Grid. Welcome back into the early line. This is Thursday, second half of the Major League Baseball season getting underway. Exciting talks here in the NFL about Jimmy Garoppolo, but it's time to talk some NBA action. And we're going to start with Kevin, the Philadelphia 76ers. James Harden, two-year deal, $68.6 million. Now, most people, Kevin, would say, wow, Harden got a monster deal. But it's not all of the deal that we're talking about because he left a little bit off of the top so the Philadelphia 76ers can go out and sign players like P.J. Tucker. Daniel House coming to town here, and he says, give me what's left over. I'll be a team player. Now, to the rest of the NBA, that's a big deal, and certainly for the Philadelphia 76ers being able to improve and keep James Harden happy. Talk about this deal, Kevin, that the Philadelphia 76ers made with James Harden here. I think this deal shows a very rare relationship, but clearly a special one between Harden and Daryl Morey. Daryl Morey throughout his entire Houston tenure tried to do whatever he could to put Harden in the best position possible to win. You know, okay, here's Dwight Howard. That doesn't work. How about Chris Paul? All right, that's not working. How about Russell Westbrook? And so on and so forth. And eventually, Daryl decides to leave Houston. And not soon after that, right, Harden's like, I'm out of here as well. Once Maury shows up in Philly, you start to connect the dots. And Harden's, look, I need to get out of here. And where did he want to go to Philly? Why? I think Daryl Maury, above all else, yes, even more so than the chance to play with Joel Embiid, who's clearly a top 10 player superstar in this sport. It's because of the trust that he has with Daryl Maury. And vice versa. Uh, Donnie, I don't know if you remember because you didn't think too much of it as much as I maybe did at the time. But remember when 
Harden had an opportunity to sign an, an extension, essentially, upon the trade deadline there with, with the in the when going to the Philadelphia 76ers. Yes. And I was like, ah, I just didn't get the paper in in time. And I was like, what the what are we doing here? Like, who doesn't get paper in on time for an extension? What's the angle here? Could Harden bolt after one season? But clearly in Philly, because of the connection between Daryl Morey and James Harden, not only were they never worried about that, but they probably have saved themselves some dollars, being the 76ers front office, on not having that done. Provided themselves the opportunity mainly to bring in a P.J. Tucker, a favorable deal with Harden, right? He probably could have held their feet to the fire. Like, I need five years and I need every single dollar you have because the Sixers needed to bring Harden back. They didn't have the leverage to let Harden walk. Certainly not. But this is a two-man job in Daryl Morey and James Harden working in unison, doing whatever they can to bring the Philadelphia 76ers a championship. And you know what's good about this, too, as well, is James Harden is still in that position where it's a two-year, $68.6 million deal, Kevin. But at the end of this year, he can renegotiate. He can be a free agent if he opts out. So you're also looking at it from a perspective from the Sixers side saying, we're probably going to get the best version that we can out of James Harden for this 2022-2023 season. Now, the thing I like about this the most is it clearly – he's still making a ton of money, right? We say, hey, he took a little bit less. I mean, basically two years, mm -hmm. $70 million. Can you imagine taking less with that type of – contract but he could have did the same thing that Russell Westbrook did and me being from Philadelphia knowing the fan base that we have here I can't imagine if James Harden out of nowhere just put out an Instagram that had him in a car with loud music in the background basically taunting the fan base saying no matter how much you care I'm taking my money I'm getting mine I'll see you in Philadelphia and instead if you're mm -hmm. James Harden and the way the season ended last year which is not what the Sixers fan had hoped when they certainly traded for James Harden over those first few games like boy is he really going to average a triple-double all the way to an NBA final? And he knows at the end of the season. Fans were a little bit on me. Let me give back here. Let me show that I'm a team player here. And you buy so much of a grace period from that, as opposed to Russell Westbrook in L.A. going, taking my $50 million. I don't care if it ruins his team. I want to get mine here first. Now, if we switch it over to the Lakers and their perspective here, what sort of trade rumors are we looking at here? Maybe moving a Russell Westbrook over to the Indiana Pacers, but we always know in their back pocket, the Lakers. Buddy Heald always sniffing around the chicken coop there, Kevin, to be a Laker, it seems. So there are a lot of different avenues that I think – are becoming potentially a reality here for the Los Angeles Lakers outside of the Kyrie Irving deal. And that's very important for them because we've heard so much about how this Kyrie scenario has saved the Lakers. And maybe even more so, how do the Lakers not give up two first-round picks for Kyrie Irving? They have no other options. And again, that's kind of stuff that's been, I think, said by a lot of people with maybe not a lot of reality backing that, trying to prop up that Brooklyn leverage. Because the Lakers have had conversations with the Indiana Pacers. The Indiana Pacers tried to sign DeAndre Ayton, Ayton to a max deal, and I don't think they were looking to compete at a high level, but at that point, you've got a young big, obviously in Ayton, you just drafted Benedict Matherin with the sixth overall pick, and your franchise guy in Tyrese Halliburton that you were able to get out of Sacramento. But things change a little bit now. You're going to be a really bad basketball team. You're very, very young. People will be excited to watch your young guys, but you are now looking to make moves off of some older players that maybe just don't fit your timeline in the way that you want. And Buddy Heald fits that description. Keep in mind, by the way, Buddy Heald only six years into his NBA career. A lot of people, Donnie, might be 24 if that's the case. Buddy Heald's 29. Was that Oklahoma? A long time, Buddy Heald. So for the Pacers... Moving off of Heald and his, you know, $21 million this year and then another 18 or so million dollars the year after, it does make sense. And the big thing that can make sense as well for the Pacers is taking on Russell Westbrook's horrific contract because it is a one-year deal. It doesn't matter what he does, whether they buy him out or let him stay there and have him, you know, be a sixth man to Halliburton. It makes no difference to the Indiana Pacers because that money is clean off the books at the end of the season and then allows them to reassess the market.
Let's take a look here, too. A two-pronged attack here from the Lakers and the Pacers' perspective here, Kevin, because it looks like, you know, that dream scenario with Kyrie Irving is on hold right now. So they're trying to make moves where the Lakers, which we both figured, they need to do something. Even if it doesn't work out in the end, you can't come back and say, we're bringing the band back together. The only thing that's going to change is Darvin Ham is our head coach. So from a Lakers perspective, from your mind here, what are we doing here if this doesn't work out, this trade deal? Forget about Kyrie Irving, but the trade deal here to the Indianapolis, the Indiana Pacers. And also, from a uh, Pacers perspective, where do they go in the future? What is their game plan here now for 2022? So, again, I think the Pacers at this point with the eight and thing missing are going to look to tank. And if I do, I do believe, by the way, because people are like, where are they going to send Russ? Once the Donovan Mitchell deal is done, I think we can all agree Donovan Mitchell will not be on the Utah Jazz to start this season. Once the Mitchell deal is done, you are going to have three teams with a lot of cap and the intentions of being bad, which are Utah, San Antonio, and then, of course, these Indiana Pacers. I'm not going to tell you there's going to be an arms race for Russell Westbrook, but if basically you have salary cap and nothing to do with it, and a team is dangling a first-round pick to take on that salary cap, and you're tanking, well, you're going to want to do that. So there are some people who, again, there are some people who have hit me up, ah, it's going to take two first-round picks to get off Russ. You're in fantasy land. You're in la-la land. That's not going to be the case there. Because if the Jazz are like, we need two to take Russ, well, then the Pacers swoop right in. Oh, well, we'll take one, give us the bad deal, and we can move off of that. Where I think things get a little more interesting, though, Donnie, is we all know that the Brooklyn Nets are operating here on a timeline where they're not moving Kyrie until the KD situation is settled, which is the correct move, by the way, because if you trade Kyrie, you lose even more leverage in any Kevin Durant conversations. You don't want to make that move. Could the Lakers potentially get to a point, maybe they have a fine deal with the Indiana Pacers, and also like, hold on, we're getting off of Russ's contract we're bringing in Buddy Heald and Miles Turner. Yeah, we're going to have to send out a draft pick, maybe two draft picks, but this makes our basketball team better, and we can't miss this opportunity. What I'm wondering, Donnie, is do the Lakers have to sit here and wait for the KD Kyrie saga to end if there is a pretty favorable deal on the table for them with these Indiana Pacers? Yeah, and that's the question that's going to be, you know, begged to ask over the next few weeks. So I also want to ask you this one as well. If we're looking for the NBA season, and again, a lot of dominoes still have to fall, but it seems like we're in that holding pattern now because just a few short weeks ago when, when we were sitting here in the afternoon talking about, hey, what's going on in the sport? Oh, my goodness. Kevin Durant just asked for a trade. Here we go. The NBA offseason is heating up, and where does everybody land? It seems like that only big domino that has fallen here was DeAndre Ayton not going to the Pacers and going back to the Suns here. In your mind, are we going to see something over the next week, week and a half, or could this actually play out into training camp and much further in this whole saga where will the Lakers make a trade? Will KD be moved? Where's Kyrie Irving going to end up? Give me a timeline here that we can look at. It's it's such a good question, and we keep hearing people saying, oh, they might drag this into September. They might drag this into September. I don't know why any party involved would want that to be the case. And what I mean, by, I don't know why the Nets would want that. I don't know why Durant would want that. And I don't know why the teams that are calling on Kevin Durant would want that either. I think you want that resolution to come in as soon as, as imaginable. So I think for me, what I almost would, would turn about and say, what needs to happen to accelerate this process? What are we waiting on to have all of the sudden there be a legitimate piece of movement here? And it's the thing that I have been asking for, and you as well, Donnie, for the longest time. It's not all of the sudden, oh, well, the, you know, the Suns have made a better offer, the Heat have made a better offer. I think it's the report that says Kevin Durant has opened his list of teams up past Miami and Phoenix. He's cool with Toronto. He's cool with Washington. He's cool with New Orleans. He's cool with Oklahoma City, the Knicks, whatever you want to possibly have. That's what I think we need because then I think the ante gets raised by all of the competing parties. So much intrigue to come here in the NBA as we wait to see where all these moving parts end up. But if we're talking Major League Baseball, we got to talk home runs. Coming up next right here on The Early Line.
Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. They played last game. The early line. Take a look at the top four seeds here in the Big Ten. They're going to play Aaron less. Rogers and the morning the after. Wilson. We saw movement in the marketplace like Orlando. Fantasy Magic. Sports the today. The Cavaliers are a little thin as well. Newswire. Minus 160 favorite on the money line today for Arizona. Pharrell coast to coast. That's where they win cups. They win Stanley Cups over there. Give me the Game pass. time decision. Kind of bizarre when you consider it. Like the, everybody is out for the Warriors. In game, live, I all like access. Vandy. I like Vandy against Bam. I think Vandy can win the game, take it four and a half. In game, four live, wins. prime oh, yeah, time. Major, the PGA champion. In yes. game, live, overtime. All done before the final bet. Get the game. winning edge only on Sports Grid. The morning after. A Yurfi or a Nerfie, Kev? Well, the Nerfie is the favored side tonight at minus 136 to stay under that half run total in the opening frame. Do you agree that maybe we won't see a run early on? I agree that it should be the favorite. I think if you made me bet it, though, I actually might be inclined to yep. touch the yes. I, 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 I do. I look at the National League lineup, and it's all righties. The Sports Grid Network. Fantasy Sports Today. I don't know where I'm at on DeAndre Hopkins. We only played in 10 games last season. He had a nagging injury that crushed his efficiency all year. I am the definition of out on DeAndre Hopkins. There's no way I'm dealing with this. When was the last time we've seen a player who's been suspended to come back and did some damage? All right? I mean, they always seem to get that soft tissue injury because they're not quite shaped. They've been out. The Sports Grid Network. The early line. Do you think a Big 12, Pac-12 merger would have made sense? No, I don't. I don't. Because when you add more teams in, Kevin, you're going to divvy up more pieces of the pie. It's the reason why you see these big guys leaving. And we're looking right now at these Pac-12 teams, Kevin, and saying to ourselves, what are you actually bringing to the table to the Big 12? Apparently not enough. Only on Sports Grid. about here as the FanDuel Sportsbook has not only uh, opened up that player specials market for who is going to win the home run crown this year, a big time Aaron Judge number there, minus 200. Kyle Schwarber looks to be perhaps the most threatening guy in that race. The question though checks in about the individual performances for a minute because we now have over-unders for players season long totals on home run props. Ten different guys that we're going to break down. And we started off with Aaron Judge and a nice, easy number for people to digest there, Donnie. A yes, no on will Judge hit 50 home runs. Over under is 49 and a half. He is at 33 at this. It's not exactly the midway point, but at the all-star yeah. break, 33 home runs. For Aaron Judge, you're going to need 17 second-half homers to cash this ticket. What do you make of that Judge number? Can he get it? Absolutely he can. But also, as you take a look at some of the other numbers we're going to get into, it seems like that strike zone, Kevin, for us here is like anywhere between like 12 to 14 home runs. So certainly when you see Aaron Judge, who is the leader in the clubhouse right now, mm -hmm. 33 home runs, guy in second place there we'll talk about shortly, is Kyle Schwarber with 29. But it seems like the expectation here is if the Yankees want to do something special, Aaron Judge is certainly going to be along for the ride and be one of those catalysts, meaning he's going to hit home runs. He knows he's in the MVP race now. What's going to propel him, Kevin? 45 home runs? Nope. 
50 home runs, probably not even enough. He's probably going to have to hit mid-50s to close to 60 home runs to take down mm-hmm. Shohei Otani here at the FanDuel Sportsbook is the current favorite here to win the AL MVP award. I, you know what's interesting here? Because we also have another guy on that list we'll get to is with the Yankees that I think I'm a little bit more optimistic. But is my optimism here saying, well, there's other guys here, Kevin, that I can take for this second half of the season to get 12 or 13 home runs? Or do I really want to spend here and say Aaron Judge is going to go off and hit 17 home runs, which again puts him at that 50 number. Now, as well as you said, you brought up a pretty good point because benchmarks in Major League Baseball are key. How about this? You hit 49 home runs. Man, that's a really, really good season. You hit 50. What a season by Aaron Judge. Mm-hmm. 50 home runs. You see how that sounds? And I love the fact that FanDuel put that at 49 and a half and made it. He needs 17 home runs to get there. Because if we know coming down the stretch, and let's just say for Aaron Judge, you always want to do right by your players. If you take a look at Boone in the dugout or that front office, you know what hits home here? Three games left in the season. The Yankees have everything, Kevin, wrapped up. And Aaron Judge has 48 or 49 home runs with three to play. Are they sitting him down? Are they saying, hey, man, go out there and make history for yourself. Get in that 50 home run club. For that reason alone, that benchmark of 50 makes me want to bet the over, even though I'm getting a premium price here where I need 17 home runs, which I do believe is probably more than everybody we're going to talk about here in the second half of the season. It's not just the biggest number. It's a seven home run gap. And he's one of only two guys that are over a four with the four as their first number there on Aaron Judge. Now, I'm trying not to be kind of warped by watching a lot of Yankees games, but here's why I bring that up. If you watch a Yanks game, they constantly talk about Aaron Judge catching Roger Maris's 61 home runs. They don't talk about him getting to 50 home runs, Donnie. So when I see yeah. 49 and a half, I'm all of a sudden saying, what, the, what, what is this 10 home run discount here? Like, I really, and they're probably not going to do it, and I got you. Can, what's the number on him getting to 60 home runs? I mean, are we talking 5-1, to 6-1, to 7-1 to one on Aaron Judge to climb the yeah. ladder? Because I'll tell you right now, that's worth, a, that's worth a couple of dollars there to me on Aaron Judge. But here is the thing. Right now, he is homered in about 37% of his games. This would put him at under uh, a homering in 25% of the remaining games. Here, I think, is really the caveat. And this could apply to every guy we talk about, but a guy like a judge probably worth bringing up more so than others. That health factor, right? He's not going to play all 70 baseball games that are left on the Yankees' schedule, but you're looking for what? 65? He's only missed three games so far. Or I think he's, I think he's maybe missed nine games so far of this Yankee season, give or take. Something along those lines. Anywhere between three and eight games I think he's probably missed for the Yankees up until this point. I do think with health, Judge has a chance to explode past this number. Because here's the other thing too, Donnie, and this will apply to everybody else. How many more you know good months do we have of legitimate hitting weather I think you could still have a good, what, six weeks of great weather, if not even extending into early September. Yes, and also, let's remember the ballpark he plays at. Yankee Stadium is a home run hitter's ballpark, and that's going to buoy him. When we talk about home run hitters of the past, right? You know, Maris, where did he play? In the old Yankee Stadium. You could hit it out to that short right porch. But also, Barry Bonds back in the day. I mean, the guy played in the ultimate pitcher's ballpark and was hitting home runs in the seven. I mean, ridiculous stuff going on. So also, when you put the spotlight on Judge for the second half of the season, right, he knows the MVP is not going to be tied to Kevin if he hits 284, which he's currently at. If he ends up with a 261 average with 61 home runs he's going to be the mvp so also you have to take a look at it you say to yourself he's a home run hitter he's a big strong powerful guy he plays in a hitter's ballpark and also you're right throughout the rest of july and august and quite frankly even in the september we'll still have some days where we're gonna hit 90 degree temperatures here in the northeast but he knows history is on his side so when you're up to the plate here in the seventh inning and nobody's on base is he just trying to kind of get on base work a walk or is he saying you know what it's my chance here Let me take a couple extra cuts here to see if I can put one into the seats. Those are always fun because when you're chasing history, chasing chasing an American League MVP award, and also possibly hitting 62 home runs for the Yankees, that's a big deal. And if you're trying to do Mm -hmm. something, that means maybe you'll struggle a little bit more with your batting average, but maybe you squeeze out, Kevin, an extra three to four home runs because that's actually what you're trying to hit. Now, here is the thing with Judge. It is not just that he's got the most home runs, but the asking price for Judge in the second half 
is the most as well, right? 17 to cash and over. Yeah. Kyle Schwarber is the only other guy that's going to be above that 39 and a half threshold at 42 and a half. 14 home runs for Kyle Schwarber in the second half is the asking price. My big takeaway when I saw the Schwarber number is how big the gap is between him and Aaron Judge when we talk about leading baseball in home runs. But who wants it out, Schwarber? Like 14 home runs. With the way this guy operates, Donnie, two weeks of baseball, he'll give you half of that asking price. Exactly. It's almost like with Kyle Schwarber, he gets off to a slow start and then heats up when hitting weather heats up throughout the summer. And the same thing we just talked about here about Aaron Judge. Where does he play, Kevin? Citizens Bank Ballpark, very forgiving mm-hmm. here in giving up home runs. Heat, humidity will be there as well in July, August, and quite frankly, in the September. It also will be nice if the Phillies get into a race where they're trying to make the playoffs and all at-bats count. And also, let's keep in mind here, when you take a look at Aaron Judge and Kyle Schwarber, there's one little difference here as well. Schwarber's a leadoff hitter in Philadelphia. That's going to need extra at-bats over the length of the season that we have. And the same way I just talked about Aaron Judge, who actually is a power hitter at 284, mm-hmm. which is elite. You take a look at Kyle Schwerber. He's hitting 208. We've always known this, Kevin. It seems like he's the Joey Gallo here of the you know National League, where it's home run or bust here. And if you're betting on home runs, what's more likely to Kyle Schwerber, a single or a home run at this point? He takes a hack, first strike, second strike, third strike, like it's all the same, and that's important here. I like Kyle Schwerber. I think it points to him hitting into the mid-40s because that's his swing, a leadoff hitter in Philadelphia playing in a good ballpark. I think he can get that number. I certainly think it's in range for him as well. This batch finishes out. Pete Alonso and Austin Riley, both at 39 and a half. Jordan Alvarez is at 38 and a half. But there's also another group of guys that I want to get to here because perhaps your most anticipated number yes. on the board comes from this batch of five players. Big time names, no doubt about it. Giancarlo Stanton, Mike Trout, Vladdy Jr., Rafael Devers, and Juan Soto. From this group of five, Donnie, who is it that is really catching your attention? There's two of them that are intriguing. I'm going to get to Mike Trout here in a second, but I got to tell you, Giancarlo Stanton for me, and also, you know, in the All-Star game, hey, man, first home run for me, catches a 15-1 to ticket, mm-hmm. second place, first loser, as you like to say, Kevin, in the betting markets here, but he did go yard. And the reason I bring that up is it's not him staying hot or him staying healthy. I think something finally clicked in his head, Kevin. He has the absolute perfect swing for Yankee Stadium. Well, wait, Don, he's not a left-handed batter. What do you mean? Perfect swing will be a left-handed batter. He has perfected Mm -hmm. the, I'm just going to go the other way with a fly ball and take my chances that it'll go 330 feet and clear that fence, regardless if it's right down the line, was it 314 at Yankee Stadium, or into that gap there. And the more I watch Yankee baseball, the more I watch Giancarlo Stan, it looks like he's positioning himself to go the opposite way. So if I look at his number here, 37 and a half at a minus 122 price, he's got 24 home runs. 13, 14, 15 home runs. That is certainly doable. Again, he's playing in Yankee Stadium. Do you see the target players that we're looking at here? A Kyle Schwarber in Philadelphia, home run hitter ballpark. Yankee Stadium with Aaron Judge here trying to do something special and get into the 50s here. And also Giancarlo Stan. He's not looking at a special number. Hey, get into the 40s or 30s. That number doesn't hit home if he hits 30. Hey, should have had more. But if I'm just looking for a second-half perspective, if he stays healthy, good weather, playing in Yankee Stadium, and it seems like he's Mm -hmm. perfected that, I'm just going to go down down the right field line and hit home runs that way. I don't have to hit 440 foot bombs to left. Just give me 330 down the right field line and I'll take that. I think he's worked it out here. I'm going Stan here. Stan was going to get to 38 home runs and cash in this ticket for me. Stanton right now, as we are at the midway point, is at 24 home runs. And again, another guy who absolutely knows how to heat up, can take a little momentum out of that all-star game, I think, as well. We mentioned Judge. Okay, big guy. You worry a little bit about the health. Stanton, same thing applies. And I don't know if this is the point you were going to make on Mike Trout, but it's certainly the one that comes yeah. off the page to me, is health. But Mike Trout, yes. uh, I think um, amongst all 10 players on this list, the big worry is health. This guy didn't play in the All-Star game. I know Jordan Alvarez did not either. But Mike Trout has played less games than what you are looking for if you are the Los Angeles Angels over the past couple of years. And he's injured right now. And the one big reason I bring this up, of course, Donnie, is last year, what did we hear? Ah, try to be back any day. Ah, Trout ran back up. Try to be back next week. And we never saw him again. He played 36 games last year. Mike Trout, the Angels are horrible. And there will come a point where it doesn't 
make a difference. They didn't bring Trout back, and they let Otani stay out there because he was hunting down the MVP. Well, 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 here we are again. Mike Trout is legitimately one of the best power hitters in baseball. He's at 24 home runs. 12 home runs in the second half for Mike Trout in his sleep unless he's not out there, Donnie. And that's why if you're making me bet Trout, I probably have to bet under. Yeah, somewhere around the All-Star break last year, just after the All-Star break, I remember when we were doing in-play sports tonight, watching the TV, and they actually had a live batting practice session under the tunnel here for Mike Trent. I believe Eduardo Perez of ESPN was doing that interview, and he was saying like, oh, here's mm-hmm. how I hit the baseball. I can't wait to come back. I'm on my way. And we never heard from Mike Trout again. So if you were to tell me right now, all right, let's just say Mike Trout misses an extra week here in the second half, and his number is only 35 and a half. That's one month out of Mike Trout here, the best baseball player on the planet. But you're right. There is an MO here for the Angels to go, hey, this is our franchise guy. We're not winning anything here. The point of him coming back in September for the final two weeks of the season is meaningless for us here. Let's put him on the bench. But if he is healthy, he should clobber that number, Kevin. We just don't know if he's going to be healthy. Which is the difficulty, of course, with this. Because here is the thing. I still want to all these guys. We're, yeah, we're talking. I mean, we're talking about superstars on exclusively yeah. superstars on this list here. They all feel like they make sense to the over until a couple of games missed start to factor in. There is a guy though on this list that we got to talk about because, well, I'm not sure what team he's going to be playing for, and that might make a difference as well. We've closed out the home run conversation. Hour number one after. This. early line do you think a big 12 pac 12 merger would have made sense no i don't i don't because when you add more teams in kevin you're gonna divvy up more pieces of the pie it's the reason why you see these big guys leaving and we're looking right now at these pac 12 teams kevin and saying to ourselves what are you actually bringing to the table to the big 12 apparently not enough only on sports grid your heart's racing. The clock's running out. It all comes down to this. We're talking pregame. 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 Get locked in with game time decisions. Your hosts, Gabe Marinci and Cam Stewart, will get you ready for game time. Everything you need to know before a game goes off the board with the best lips to back it up. Make your best bet with live odds updates, late breaking news, up to the minute injury reports, and real time analytics from inside the sports books. All the odds, all the action from sports wagering insiders and industry pros like Donnie Wrightside, Gam Lou, Cousin Sal, the pro football doc, Dr. David Chow, and more. Get the winning edge every weekday afternoon from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern, 3 to 4 Pacific. It's game time decisions only on Sports Grid. Pharrell, coast to coast. He is finished. He'll come back next year. It'll happen again, and he'll never pitch again. That'll be the end of it. I, I think that Strasburg had his he had his moment in that World Series when the Nationals won it. He gave it all out, and, and he, he had injury problems before that. And now he just hasn't been able to stay on the field since. Uh, It's unfortunate, but I think that he is finished. The Sports Grid Network. The morning after. That it means more for the league where it always just means more to add Texas and Oklahoma from the Big Ten adding USC and UCLA. Texas comes in with its own network uh, that has its own set of advertisers and money and everything else that they'll fold into the SEC. I know you as a perennial uh, college football playoff team contender. Will they be that in the SEC? No, but they are a team that brings that sort of prestige with them. The Sports Grid Network.
run leaders. A lot of good names on this list. It's very interesting that Otani isn't on it, by the way. But Juan Soto mm-hmm. is, and his number is 33 and a half. Here's the deal on Juan Soto. He's got 20 home runs right now. So you're going to need 14 homers to get over that Juan Soto number. Here's the interesting thing, Donnie. Last year, they said that he used the home run derby to fix his swing and heat up. Well, he's piping hot heading into the home run derby. He wins the whole thing. Last year, he went out and hit 18 home runs post-All-Star break for the Washington Nationals. Man, I tell you, if this guy lands in Yankee Stadium, I feel like they juiced a number to like 40 and a half because they'd start to think short left porch, short left porch. But, Donnie, he's red hot. He heated up last year in the second half after the home run derby and could find himself in a significantly better lineup, therefore seeing better pitches in two yeah. weeks' time. I got to be taking a look at a Juan Soto over for the second half. Yep, you hit the nail on the head here because most people would say, like, hey, just leave him in Washington. He should be able to get 34, which he probably will do. But at the same time, mm-hmm. if you're looking to beat the Washington Nationals, Kevin, what do you do? Pitch around Juan Soto. What are you pitching to the guy for? So I think the point is valid. Even if you wind up in a pitcher's ballpark, per se, where we hear say, hey, the Dodgers can go after him, right? We hear the Padres can go after him. Two true, two, excuse me, two true pitcher's ballparks there out west. But then again, he'll be sandwiched in between Tatis and Machado, or let's just say both of the Turners, or Freddie Freeman out in Los Angeles. You can't pitch around them anymore. So I think I'm with you. If he moves on, I like it even more, the prospects of Juan Soto going over his 33-and-a-half number here. Uh, I tell you, it's it's just so interesting to see. Like, this guy, Donnie, on the season has 20 home runs right now and only 43 RBIs. Just no opportunity for him out there right now in Washington, which is fascinating. I will say the one thing that is really puzzling me is why we do not have an Otani over-under. I mean, like, this is a a list made of stars. Otani is the star of... Are they worried about something that we're not, you know, fully aware of when it comes to show a interesting stuff? But he will be discussed as we make the move over to our number two on Facebook. 